I think people adopt Bitcoin and Bitcoin's a weird, confusing thing. That's like the reality. It's very foreign to people who are in tech, people who are in finance, people who are in government, etc. It's very foreign to educated, indoctrinated people. One of the best articles out there is Creasis article. It's the why did the yuppie elite dismiss Bitcoin? It's weird. Bitcoin is this weird thing. So we see Bitcoin based on our priming. All right, CK, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Brom, what's up, man? Nice to finally chat. You've been doing a lot of awesome interviews recently. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, super cool to to connect. I think, uh, yeah, we spoke last year briefly around like the Bitcoin Amsterdam conference. So fun to to have a longer chat right now. Yeah, appreciate those words. I just trying to do my part, you know, I think uh, just as you are trying to do yours. So I think we'll, we'll definitely talk about what you're doing right now. I, I do wanted to start with, your the beginning of your Bitcoin journey. Like, how did you first become interested in Bitcoin or or finance and economics in general? Yeah, well, in terms of Bitcoin for millennials, you know, with uh, Peter McCormick stepping away from the limelight, you know, big big opportunity for the Bitcoin podcasters out there. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, I think I think you have the chops, man. But in terms of my Bitcoin journey, I've been working in the space since February 2018, uh, and people, you know, have heard of the 2017 bull run. Pretty much at the tail end of that bull run, I was told by a friend, check out Bitcoin. This is like the best investment I ever made. And that was the first time I actually took it seriously. And I spent time Mm -hmm. researching it. Prior to that, though, I was already very into personal finance. That was kind of at the beginning of my professional career, working in sales, making commission, wanting to make my money work for me, you know, kind of getting a taste of working remotely, four-hour work week, stuff like that. I was like, I need to manage my personal finances and create financial freedom for myself. And that kind of was perfectly timed with me actually paying attention to Bitcoin for the very first time. So I think I was going to a wedding and that wedding was four hours away from where I lived, which was San Francisco at the time. I was going by myself, so I listened to every single episode of Laura Shin's podcast, and I think on two x speed there, you know, on the way to the wedding and on the way back. And then I got home Sunday night. My uh, girlfriend, now wife, you know, walks into our apartment, and I'm like, "Babe, I'm buying Bitcoin. Like, this is a big deal." So it was like <laughs> nice. almost overnight, I was I was convinced that there's something here. In that moment, I was like, I downloaded Coinbase, I bought Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin. It was more like crypto is a big deal. All of this is a big deal. Like I need to investigate this more. But it actually did not take me very long to go from just generally optimistic about crypto to Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, and the reason was, so I, I you know, discovered Bitcoin probably, I don't know, like August 2017. And then by, by November 2017, I was like a Bitcoin maximalist. So I think like from the, you know, the grand scheme of people going through that journey, that was pretty fast. Mm. And I think a big reason is because I had, I'd been working for tech companies and uh, I've seen both the tech companies I've been working for raise money and they were raising money like on the order of 15 million, right? And these are tech companies, startups that have real real products, real customers, real staff, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you're, you've been in the tech world for a long time, the startup world for a long time. You're familiar with the multiples that tech companies raise on the Series B and things like that. And in 2017, the biggest thing was Ethereum and ICOs. And that was like the crypto run. And there's all these crypto meetups in SF. And I was talking to all these people who were like walking around wearing ledgers on their neck and things like that. And, you know, I was kind of experiencing that like very heads on. I was like investigating this space and I just started Googling like, what's wrong with crypto? What's wrong with blockchain? (laughs) And like the only people saying anything coherent happened to be Bitcoin maximalists. So I kind of because of that, you know, and I guess the toxic maxis in 2017, that enabled me to discover the good resources, right? Ansel Lindner's Bitcoin Markets is one of the earliest and best. TFTC was just getting started with Marty Bent. World Crypto Network, uh, Tone Vase, Jimmy Song, all these people were actually putting out good content. They were recommending the Bitcoin standard. And like, that's where it went from like, okay, I'm like a Bitcoin maximalist to like, I'm very hardcore into Bitcoin maximalism. 
plus I'm trying to work in this space. Uh, so I was really lucky. You know, I quit my job two weeks before Christmas and for Christmas, I asked my parents. So, you know, that was pretty much the top, right? The very top of the Bitcoin market, I quit my job. So <laughs> I think there's, <laughs> there's some, some comedy there, but it worked out. I asked my parents to buy me a ticket to the North American Bitcoin conference in Miami, which is a complete shit show, shit coin conference. Uh, and I met the Bitcoin magazine people there. So that was in January of 2018. And then by mid February, I had the job. I was like doing sales for them. And, you know, I, I feel like very blessed that I was able to go from like, I discovered Bitcoin to I'm a Bitcoin maximalist to I have a Bitcoin job at what turned into a really legitimate and, and favorable media startup in the space. And yeah, I just feel really blessed that I got to start out that way as well as like, kind of took the, the fast track to what I think is the correct way to view the craziness that's happening in terms of like this evolution. Yeah. So I was, I was thinking, you know, b based on this journey, I, uh, I applaud you for being this quick, <laughs> to be honest, like 2017, I think my Bitcoin interest was a little bit lower. And I was like, you know, exploring Ethereum ICOs, like, I don't know how many Neo banks. I funded that never came, came to me, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, it's uh, you got a shit coin before you Bitcoin, I think. So eventually you're, you're yeah. getting into that, but I think, uh, yeah, some interesting threads to pull on, uh, pull on. I think first, like you mentioned, you were exploring like personal finances, you know, or, or, you know, building out that, did you have any approach when you were doing that or were you just lucky Bitcoin came on your path and that's kind of, you know, the road that you followed? Yeah. I mean, at the time, if you asked me, like, do I have an approach? I would have said absolutely. But I think it was very rudimentary, right? I, I'd read some like pretty solid books that kind of just went through like how to think about personal finance more than like strategies for how to do personal finance. And I still think like a lot of that thinking and learning has colored my approach and, you know, the content and, thinking I put out in Bitcoin. But yeah, generally speaking, you know, I, I, my approach to personal finance is keep it stupid simple and focus on what you can do and don't make yourself suffer too much. So it's a little bit different than a lot of Bitcoiners who are like, sell your chairs, you know, go all in on Bitcoin. This is your only opportunity to make it. And it's like a little bit more patient and achievable because, you know, I think with personal finance, the biggest thing is like, being is do is ex actually executing and doing it and not, you know, overspending, not, you know, taking too much risk and achieving financial freedom. So yeah, I, I try to take, you know, I kind of have like a principles based perspective on personal finance. And it's, you know, for me, it served me well. I have, you know, I guess you're not supposed to talk about how much Bitcoin you have, but you know, I've, I've been early in Bitcoin and taking it seriously and accumulating. And I, live a comfortable lifestyle and I'm happy with my assets and I'm not stressed out about it. And yeah, I feel like it's working like just as applied to my lifestyle. So yeah, I mean, I'm happy, happy to talk about it a little bit more, but that's just kind of how I think about personal finance. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night, gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution? OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card 
and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. I think it's interesting because you probably understood like short time preference or like a low time preference, high time preference, perhaps a little bit later on when you did read like Bitcoin standard and stuff. But for these eight hours in the car, when you listen to the podcast, what, what was like the moment where you were like, okay, this is, I should really dive into this thing. And also, well, you started Googling what's wrong with, with crypto. I don't know if you got the answers there, but you know, there's a distinction obviously, right? And you eventually chose to dive into Bitcoin. Why, why, why was that? Was there a specific thing there? Yeah, no, good question. So, you know, I talked about how I was, I think people will adopt Bitcoin and see Bitcoin, like Bitcoin's a weird, confusing thing. That's mm. like the reality. It's very foreign to people who are in tech, people who are in finance, people who are in government, et cetera. It's very foreign to educated, indoctrinated people. One of the best articles out there is Croesus article yes. is the why did why did the dismiss bitcoin dismiss yeah. bitcoin it's it so it's weird bitcoin is this weird thing so we see bitcoin based on our priming or we don't see bitcoin based on our priming so honestly like a, another really big reason why i was able to see bitcoin quickly was because in college i did research focused on how do universities and academics who are leveraging open source big data resources to do big data research, how do they uh, uh, like upgrade their code and how do they manage forks and like focusing on like the community c- communication element, not necessarily like the, the technical elements, but like this soft element, right? Like the, the people element layer yeah. of that. So we went to like co- these academic conferences with big data nerds and like interviewed them and they're like, what the hell are we, <laughs> are we being interviewed by, you know, you college <laughs> kids, that kind of thing. But, you know, out of you know, working up with that and being exposed to my brother, who's really into tech, he's like a big Apple stan and like, he could like wire, he, he could, he could wire a smart home, you know, in a couple of days by himself. And that's like his passion, not really his career. Right. So, you know, growing up with him, plus that experience, plus the personal finance interest, you know, I'm sitting in the car and I'm listening to this. And at the time specifically, it was actually a, a back and forth between Laura Shin and then two different Bitcoin developers talking about the fork, like the, the Bcash fork situation and then Segwit2x. And I'm sitting there, I was like, holy crap, there's a protocol for money on the internet. And for whatever reason, and that made a lot of sense to me immediately. And at the time I was taking Ethereum, like in the moment I was taking Ethereum seriously, I was like, and there's these other things that are protocol layers for other things. But, you know, it was almost immediately like, holy crap, with Bitcoin, there's like, there is this money internet protocol for money and it's on the internet and it's live. And that's the first time I like thought about that concept even right Interesting. and yeah. for whatever reason i was just like i need to get in on it and part of the reason too is like when you're in silicon valley when you're in the bay area you want to get in early on a startup that is going to exit yes so i was already i was also already primed to how do i get in early on startup equity so with bitcoin i saw it as like oh shit here's an opportunity to buy the native thing that i that is early Right. And that I can appreciate from. So now I work for the Human Rights Foundation and help them with their Bitcoin strategy and executing everything we do there. But it started from like very much a like, oh, my gosh, I'm like there's a there's the Internet protocol for money. and I can get in on it early. That was like the very first thing I thought of. Love that. I, I think that's interesting because that that protocol part came I looked at it always as like from a technological point of view, I think like how Jack Dorsey once said also around the time, I think like Bitcoin, yeah, it's just money for the internet. But I think the protocol angle uh, really opened my eyes, right? Because a protocol is, is just a set of rules, basically. Like it's, this is my set of rules and this is how I work. And I think... What I recently actually just learned is, you know, also in, in talking with people, when people say like, oh, Bitcoin doesn't produce anything, you know, why are you so sure about it, etc. And now I finally understand that the keeping 
the promise of the protocol alive, keeping the protocol as it was intended. That is the entire goal of Bitcoin. Like the goal is to not change, to just be the same, to be, you know, in a hundred years, it's, it's the same set of rules, basically. And this is what eventually gives you the certainty that the thing itself will not change. It's kind of like, okay, gold always keeps the same color or whatever. But this mm-hmm. is in a worldwide distributed, you know, permissionless network, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that word, that word protocol, like that took me a long time to get, but I love that you shared like, this is your touch point where you got in, right? And I think that's also why it's nice to have these conversations, but I think also difficult to understand Bitcoin is like, yeah, you have to run into the touch point that, you know, touches you basically. Yeah, no, because Bitcoin is weird, right? And it's very difficult to grok it without a lot of exposure. And then sometimes you get that exposure before you even discover Bitcoin. And that's like the priming. But I mean, I I, I feel lucky again. I, I was primed in right place, right time. Probably yeah. no better place to few places better than the Bay Area to be. Maybe New York, Singapore, Hong Kong. You know, there, there's a handful of places on planet Earth in 2017 where they were the place to be, to be immersed. So yeah. I was able to go deep and go deep really hard and not have issues, right? Like you said, you were in the space for many years before meeting Bitcoiners at an event. I went to a Bitcoin event immediately. Like, yeah, as soon yeah, as I was that's into cool. it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. so that really helped accelerate it too. Nice, yeah. Well, I think it's also part of this curiosity to, to discover and try things out, as you mentioned. Also like, oh, can I be early? Well, I can only be really early if I understand it to a certain degree that's acceptable for you, right? That could be different mm-hmm. for me and, and any other people. So you kind of like, yeah, incentivize yourself to do the work so you can figure out, should I be actually early to this thing? You know, and I think in part, that's also what rewards you in Bitcoin is because you start to see that it's fun to dive into something and to broaden your knowledge and then also figure out that you're kind of like right in a certain way. I don't want to say, yeah, maybe that's the wrong expression, but more like, okay, like I, I did the work and I really understand this thing that gives you, that can give you a lot of personal trust in yourself, you know? And I think like, that's a nice, like second order effect of just doing the study to understand the thing. Yeah. I mean, and I think for a lot of people, they talk about how Bitcoin is a massive growth opportunity for them. You know, for me, if I look at my career, Pre Bitcoin, post Bitcoin, you know, it was a hockey stick, right? So I think, you know, there's a lot of testimonies of that personal experience of being rewarded for doing the work and then becoming more confident, given more opportunities, uh, building businesses, opportunities, contributing to something bigger, building profiles, media, whatever. You know, I haven't seen a community that is like <laughs> bootstrapping itself kind of off of this interest our interest in general, you know, as prolifically as Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, I Just before we started talking, I mentioned to you, I was at Bitcoin Atlantis, at the Bitcoin Atlantis conference. And we had like a discussion because, or, you know, conversation around, there's people from all around the world that are interested in this thing, that fly to an island. And we were just talking about like, what, what other type of subject would make people do that? I mean, you have, we, we, we talked about Comic Con, Furry Con, whatever, but it's, we talked about the decentralization, like the, it, it's literally all over the world, like across religions, ethnicity, mm-hmm. age, any, mm-hmm. any. Bitcoin is halal. Right? Yeah, it's ultra halal, I would say. But yeah, so we, but we said there's, it's almost like m- maybe religion is above it, you know, in, when you look at the world. So I definitely don't want to say Bitcoin is a religion, but what I think is interesting is that there is this thing that exists that attracts all these people from around the world to get to a place and then talk about it together. Like we couldn't really come up with a lot of other things where yeah, this selection, a selection of people like that does that, right? Like it's, it's just an interesting observation. Yeah. So two things to kind of play into what you're talking about. First, you know, talking about Comic-Con, I I used to put on the Bitcoin conference, the one that was just in Nashville and Mm. uh, prior in Miami. Pretty much I was there at the beginning through the the last one in Miami where I was the executive producer, as well as one of the Amsterdam events. Since then, obviously, BTC Inc. has done a lot of amazing work. They've expanded internationally in a big way. They're doing Miami number, or sorry, they're doing Amsterdam number three. So, you know, they've continued to do great things. But 
we used to describe the Bitcoin conference as the consumer electric show meets Comic Con meets, you know, Bitcoin meets money. Yeah. Uh, so it's like all of it, like kind of mashed together. It, it's truly a cultural as well as an academic revolution. I would describe Bitcoin as an overall paradigm shift, which is why I think it seems like it's so weird. And I think like it hits on so many different things because it's actually changing the game, right? Like that's what a paradigm shift is, is mm -hmm. the game is changing because there's new rules and that's the Bitcoin rules. And, you know, I think that's why people call it the Bitcoin game because we're all playing the Bitcoin game now. Since Satoshi Nakamoto released the code, we're all playing the game. So, yeah, you know, that was like one big thing. The other thing is, you know, and I wasn't going to mention this because it's kind of like weird, esoteric thought. Oh, no, but, you're you know, at the right you've place. You've kind of prompted me <laughs> twice now. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to drop it. But, you know, I really do like the I like the this area of like comparing Bitcoin to religion. Not because I think like, OK, religion is bad and Bitcoin is religious zealots. I think that's like the like mush brain perspective of the world. Religions are very, very interesting social tools and protocols in order to coordinate people, you know, and the idea of like religious people are like stupid people because they follow these rules and protocols. Like, I think that that's kind of like an incomplete view of the world and it's not really sophisticated. And OK, yeah, there are flaws in religions that are out there. And like, do they point to the ultimate truth? Most likely not. I don't know. I'm not that smart. But I can tell you that any other like kind of reference point that anyone else is trying to use also does not point to perfect truth. I'm very humble about like that reality. So like I, I'm pretty open minded to like, okay, like the value, the utility that can come from humans adopting religion, right? And then when we think about, okay, like what are all the fights in religion about? Like whether it's Islam, whether it's Christianity, whether, you know, I think you can name any religion, they all have like similar fights. The fights are whose version of what happened back then is actually true. Like mm -hmm. that's almost always what the fights are about. And you can look back at like Orthodox religions that like their whole shtick is like, we are the original version of whatever. Right. And then their whole shtick is like the very words that are uttered out of so-and-so's mouth, Jesus's mouth, Muhammad's mouth. Like we are interpreting them and following them exactly how they did it. And that's actually the value is doing these old things. And so I'm, I'm, I'm Christian Orthodox. At least I was raised that way. And so in the kind of teachings of the history of, you know, the Eastern Orthodox Church is this idea of like, okay, how do you start a church? Okay, well, you had a priest. That priest had what's called a hand over shoulder relationship with another priest. Uh, and there's a chain of hand over shoulder relationships that lead to the apostles and then Jesus. That's the only way to start a church is like you had that kind of hand over shoulder relationship with someone else that had a hand over shoulder. And, and that's chain, basically. You that's mean. a chain. Mm -hmm. And ultimately what happened is like the hand over shoulder relationship, like between when there was a fission between the Catholic Western church and the Eastern church, the Orthodox church, it was like about what the interpretation of the past and then which hand over hand over shoulder relationship and which version of the interpretation, like the future priests were going to adopt. Right. So that's almost like a chain split. So then I started thinking about, okay, so if there's this sophisticated religion protocol, that's the whole point of it for many cases is to preserve what happened in the past into the future and having that, that fidelity to Genesis, if you will. And like, there's this, like, it's almost like this technology is this hand over shoulder relationship. Those are, that's like a, a chain and nodes, right? And then if you were to compare that to like what Bitcoin is, like Bitcoin is that 2.0. It's that automated. Like mm. Bitcoin gives you fidelity to the Genesis block perfectly yeah. and to all other blocks, you know? So not only is it kind of like this revolution to money, to all these other things, I could talk about mining all day, but from like a social, like the value of knowing what happened into the past perfectly and fidelity to Genesis, which is clearly important if you just look at <laughs> everything around us, historically speaking, and how things have adopted, like kind of progressed. It's really, I think super insane to just think about bitcoin in that way yeah yeah i love that i i, I love the also the, the the term of like bitcoin is engineered truth 
Like there is not really anything else in the world that is like that, where you can go back to this Genesis and have a fully, you know, uncorrupted audit possibility of that time chain of events. There's nothing really like that. And I like the idea of thinking like, what could come from that? You know, so if you adopt that engineered truth of, you know, the 600 gigabytes of numbers and letters, which is, I think, a whole nother subject we could go into, right? You know, did Bitcoin already exist? You know, like stuff, stuff like that. That's some crazy stuff too, man. The, the, I love, I love, I love that. Yeah. Because the letters and the numbers already existed, right? But, but let's stick with the other people. Like if people adopt a certain engineered truth or this engineered truth, right? And they start acting upon that basis. And that will also permeate through all the actions that they take on top of that, what that base layer basically is, right? So whether that's the concept of proof of proof of work, right? Or certain values, decentralization, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can take a few elements from what make up, you know, or what eventually get, let's say, produce this engineered truth. And well, yeah, may, maybe that does come religion i don't know like you, you could define it as that but i think there are some elements to that where people adopt a certain way of living or values etc and they use the that engineered truth as just the base layer of everything they do on top yeah look again i think the the term <laughs> religion it, turn it, itself <laughs> it has it has stigma i agree but if you think about it as coordination technology and maybe even technology that tries to bring you closer to truth, even if it's not perfectly successful mm -hmm. at that. And then you look at Bitcoin from that realm, like, you know, Bitcoin could be the basis of future, you know, religions, which is like the social layer on top of that, you know, kind of truth that you talked about. And that would be one of its highest forms of adoption, right? Is like yeah. this protocol in the sky that people, you know, kind of worship. And, you know, not <laughs> saying that, you know, I want that or that is the like the right thing, but it's just such a big deal. The truth is so good and, yeah. and perfect. And the fidelity to the original is so perfect. You know, it, it's why wouldn't that be the case? So I don't know. I think Bitcoin is this weird thing, which makes you look at all of human history, right? Yes. And look at like human behavior in a, in, in a very interesting way, which is I think why all these philosophers are attracted to it now. And it, it forces you to just revisit everything, which is one of the most important elements of Bitcoin is that it makes you look at the old world and then be like, but that doesn't work with Bitcoin. So maybe yeah. it doesn't have to be this way. Yeah. Well, perhaps, yeah, it's more a philosophy than, than a religion. And I agree if once you start comparing, Hey, there's this thing that's fully auditable, transparent, you know, apolitical, all a religious, all these things. And then you have this, this current thing. And just because the one thing, you know, that Bitcoin exists, you see all the flaws in this other thing that you previously didn't even think about or didn't even see or didn't even bother you, I would say. Right. And so. It's more, it's rather than a, a philosophy of being able to verify things, etc. And then, yeah, once you, you know, apply that to other parts of your life or your upbringing or any, you know, your your own paradigm, view, view of the paradigm that you live in, then, yeah, it starts showing the flaws. And then you have this, you know, red pill, blue pill, orange pill type <laughs> of moment, I would say, where you cannot ignore the fact that these two things exist next to each other, right? then you have to totally. make uh, a more conscious choice as to to what you could adopt. So is adopting Bitcoin, uh, you know, you, you, you came for the technology, but also the number go up and you stayed for the revolution. Is this the biggest impact that Bitcoin has had on your life? Or was that the career that you now have? Or is there something else? Like what, what was the biggest impact of adopting Bitcoin for you? Oh man, good question. I got to think about that a little bit. I mean, yeah, I th we touched on it, you know, these uh, stories about it just totally changed your life. Like it's totally changed my life, right? I changed where I lived multiple times, you know, partially because of decisions driven by my career in Bitcoin. I traveled the world. I think financially, I've been able to better myself in a way that I probably would not have been on the path for prior to Bitcoin. Yeah, amplified positive traits and skills. So yeah, I can't really complain. Did not expect any of that, but overall would recommend. Absolutely. Nice. 
So you uh, just mentioned when you explain Bitcoin, you know, you talk about paradigm shift. Is is that how you would explain it to a complete novice? Maybe that's already a bit too much. What? No, you got to tailor your approach. These days, and I'm talking to a complete novice, I talk about HRF. And the reason is because people can be like, oh, HRF, that is a good, noble cause fighting mm -hmm. for democracy. And then you open up with, okay, well, what we've, you know, come to experience is that if you're a demo, if you're, in, if you are a activist or a freedom fighter who wants democracy in a place where you can't have a voice, the very first thing that an authoritarian will do is take away your bank account. And because yeah. of that, we started using Bitcoin to get them funds. And then we saw how early Bitcoin was and how much help it needed. And then we built out our program to support Bitcoin adoption and development. And that's kind of when I joined us like at that that point where that team was getting built. And usually like that's actually a really good orange filling moment. So like HRF, the reason I joined HRF is because I thought Gladstein was putting out the most compelling narratives about Bitcoin, period. And him and I actually became friends when I was at Bitcoin Magazine because I helped him put those, you know, effectively publish those narratives on BitcoinMagazine.com. And then we, him and Alan Farrington with their two books helped me bootstrap Bitcoin Magazine books. And, and we were able to publish, you know, several books by Gladstein as well. Hidden Repression, Check Your Financial Privilege, two incredible resources still to this day. So highly encourage people to check that out, those two books. But yeah, I mean, the narratives from the humanitarian perspective, like the reality is, is there is 8 billion people on planet Earth today. 1 billion of them have property rights, good-ish currency and investable assets. So that means seven out of eight billion don't have all three or, you know, one or all of those things. Mm. Many of them have none of those things. So they're forced to use bad currency. There's no investable assets and they have no property rights, liberal freedoms. So Bitcoin solves the property rights and the sound money part for everyone right away. Like that's crazy. So when people think about how much better the world could be is like, how about we bring those seven billion people online? How about we give them the ability to like not be destitute? And, and then you tie that to like, you know, the economics of Bitcoin mining and what that does for energy production. You look at folks like Gridless, what they're doing in Africa. It's like, these aren't just stories anymore. You know, these aren't just theories. Like it's actually happening. Like Bitcoin is, is changing the world for 7 billion people, giving them energy, giving them property rights, giving them sound money. And the dollar system did not do that. It actually, failed to do that. And it was designed not to do that. Exactly. Right. It's actually yeah. designed to milk the 7 billion people for the mm -hmm. 1 billion people. Like yeah. people always talk about like, oh, we had so much innovation on the dollar standard. It's like, yeah, at the expense of what? Yeah. So it's agree. crazy to think about. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I talked with Gladstein about this, right? We talked about why do, why do people don't understand Bitcoin? And, and of course he talked about this financial privilege. And I think this is a really interesting angle, right? Because uh, as you said, like company like Gridless are, are also bringing energy and electricity to places that didn't have that before. And with Bitcoin, these communities are actually getting money that is separate from their state that they, they can use with anyone, right? So this crazy little internet protocol is improving people's lives in places that most Western people didn't even think about or look at, right? because they are stuck in their own financial privilege of how well they are doing. And I think, yeah, we, in general, we should talk about this more because all this stuff is already happening. I think the bigger fight for Bitcoin is probably in the countries where these 1 billion people live than in, in, in the places where the other 7 billion people live. Right? Because Well, there's, there's a, I guess, controversial book called The Sovereign Individual, which talks about this. And I, that's actually a, a book that I was lucky enough to like grind through early in my Bitcoin career. Cause it's really colored my, my view of the world. And actually I read it pre COVID. Uh, so I read it pre COVID and then COVID happened. And I remembered the predictions about locking down borders, the use of biological weapon or some sort of pandemic virus in order to keep in your, your tax base and to prevent travel. Uh, because the thesis of one of the thesis of the sovereign individual is that we get more choice because with internet money like Bitcoin, now you can liquidate all your value into a digital currency and then take it with you. And there's going to be more, there's going to be more jurisdictional competition, which is going to create 
more freedoms because people will be able to choose where they live instead of being stuck where they live. Because right now, I was lucky to be born in the US. You were lucky to be born in the Netherlands. We have the privilege of being able to travel because we have governments that trust each other and they can produce documents that they trust. But a lot of people don't have the freedom to, to move, right? If you live in, in Kenya, you can't get a Western visa because they don't trust your Kenyan passport because they think it could be fake, right? Or that it's, you know, a terrorist is leveraging a you know bad government system in order to take advantage of it. So it's very difficult to travel. And then it's even more difficult to take your value with you if you want to travel with it. So if you want to escape a place that you don't want to be in, it's super hard today. So Bitcoin offers an opportunity for that to change. And maybe if countries start behaving differently towards each other and start letting people move there, as long as they can like prove value, et cetera. And the easy way to do that is to sign a message saying, I have this much Bitcoin, then they can trust you. And maybe they, they think that you could be beneficial for the society. And maybe there's a different way that the world works. But yeah, sovereign, I don't know why, I don't know why I went on that tangent, but you know, sovereign individual, this thesis that predicted, you know, a lot of these things, including this kind of like, let's call it the, the lag of the incumbents, which, you know, are the, the current West. Despite, I think, Bitcoin having democratic and Western values imbued, they're just going to resist the adoption. And I, you know, it's honestly a thesis within the book that I hope they're wrong because I don't want to leave, you know, but with that being said, you know, I, I feel like it's prudent to prepare yourself for like the, the one billion that is benefiting from the existing system to resist the new system. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting thought, right? Like it's once you, and I, I think it was, or it was Alex's book or something I read about how in Central Africa, you have this Central African Frank CF, FCA, CFA. The, the CFA Frank. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's a currency that France creates and they use it to buy stuff in, I think there's 11 or 12 countries that use it, right? And these countries use it all also within and, and between each other. But it's a currency that France creates. And I think there was, uh, this country is called the Niger. They have like uranium, like 90% of the ura uranium goes to France and they pay with the, <laughs> with the CFA, right? And once, once I got into that, because I think there was like, they were kicking out the French in Niger. And like, that's when I kind of like went into that. And then I thought, Wow, like all this prosperity we have comes from fuckery like this. And no one really acknowledges that in the Western world. And in that way, as you alluded to, Bitcoin is a, is a threat to this way of, you know, it's, it's kind of this neo colonization or something like it's financial colonization or something like that. Yeah, it threatens their easy access to certain types of, of, of resources, right? So it does make sense they go against it. But I think in the bigger picture, if you think about it, like eventually it will be better for everyone to adopt a neutral heart, you know, worldwide money. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is kind of the challenge of life in general, don't you think? Like <laughs> that there's always resistance before you you well, yeah, the incumbents always resist. Yeah. Uh, I read a book before Bitcoin, but in my in my startup days, it was called The Lean Startup. And I always talk mm -hmm. about this innovator's dilemma. So when you're the winner, it's hard to beat yourself in the future is, is the idea. And, you know, it's usually innovation comes from someone who's not winning, striving to win, right? Yeah. So it, it makes complete sense. Yeah, interesting. My thesis was on, on Lean Startup. Yeah, but it's really this, right? Like it's the, I always looked at it like this, like you have to create your own boundaries and that's when you will get creative, right? If you have like unlimited resources and no boundaries, then you are A, not creative and B, you are also blind to anything that would threaten your way of, of operating, whatever you're operating, right? And so from that perspective, as a fellow Bitcoin Maxi, also just really, I want to say entertained in like just seeing this unfold right like i think you would have the same view as to like bitcoin is inevitable in a sense it's not going to zero anymore right and if it's not going to zero and it is actually the most prime asset store of value property to ever exist then slowly but surely over time people will gravitate towards that right and that will give a lot of tension in the existing system and 
yeah, I think, I don't know another word, but for me, it's entertaining. Like I would, uh, there's so many ideas around it, right? But it's also so fun to just watch it unfold in a certain sense. No, I, I think entertaining is perfect, but you have to have the right mentality to think it's entertaining. And I think you have to have the right position size to think it's entertaining. You know, I've seen a lot of Bitcoiners over allocated and not think it's very entertaining. And they're kind of like, they're not focused on marveling at the adoption. Right. And, mm. and, and, uh, and they're more focused on, you know, their bags or the bags they don't have, et cetera. Yeah. So I think that if you do Bitcoin right, there's a, there's some peace of mind to it. And then from there, you know, you can kind of sit back, you know, grab the popcorn and yeah. grab the steak bikes, bites, if you will, and, and just kind of <laughs> chill and watch the show. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's the kind of ride to be on. And I mean, like I, I say this all the time. I, I think this is hyper Bitcoinization. Like people are talking about like hyper Bitcoinization as this is this future thing, but hyper Bitcoinization is the process of infinity getting divided by 21 million and everyone acknowledging it. And I think like we're watching it happen, right? Like, mm -hmm. and I've been here since 2017, people have been here longer. And, you know, I think if you ask anyone at any point in time in the past, like what the future will look like in Bitcoin, I think all of them were way too bearish. And I, I still think that that's the case, right? Yeah. So people are chronically not optimistic enough about adoption. And then two, like, I think they're not appreciating the fact that like, wow, we get to be here and live this and watch this as it like unfolds in front of us. Yeah. There's never been a monetization event that has promised to get adopted like technology, right? Like yeah. viral internet-based technology. So we're, we're going to see iPhone level adoption happening, you know, from 2018 to 2020, you went from no, sorry, from 2008 to 2020, you went from no one using the iPhone to everyone using the iPhone or everyone using a smartphone. And now smartphones are like literally in everything. It's like you buy some random product. <laughs> guess yeah. what? There's a smartphone in it because it's the cheapest damn screen <laughs> out there. Yeah. So like that, that 10 year period was absolutely wild. 12 year period is wild. So we're going to see that times the gold, right? You know, by goldization, gold standard took thousands of human his thousands of years in human history to get adopted and mm -hmm. get implemented. And then it got broken many times. We're going to see, you know, that process at the speed of the iPhone, yeah. right? And that's, it's just crazy. I would agree to that. I think that's a great analogy. I think two things. It's sometimes, I think it's very hard to, I've, and I've had these many, many times, you know, like I, I think you would have to say, like sometimes you're in this internet rabbit hole or something, right? And you, you look at, uh, or you watch videos on YouTube or stuff about Bitcoin and then you end up at this place where you're like, okay, if it's really everything in the world divided by 21 million, you know, all the value in the world represented by these 21 million units, that's like a really big deal and a really revolutionary thing. And I've had many times where I then thought like my ego came in, you know, and would be like, no, it couldn't be like that. No, it's not that big. Like you cannot really comprehend the fact that you were like living through that period of time to not read about it, but actually be in it. And I think that just that concept is already pretty hard to grasp because you cannot really imagine that you're living through such a switch in time, right? Of course, it's conceptual what we think it will be. But there's also a lot that backs that up, right? So it's not just a thought. It's kind of like pretty strong thesis, actually. And it's, yeah, so it's, it's, it's just hard to think about, okay, this could actually be right. And I'm here. Like I have to do something, right? I have to talk about this. Well, we're here. Right. So some, some, something like that. And I think, yeah, that in general is just, it's just really, just a really interesting personal test. I would say. Look, I think benefiting the most from this process, from hyper Bitcoinization, from Bitcoin adoption, like it's going to require an immense amount of humility from the individual who's like trying to like navigate it. Cause I think it's just going to be absolutely bonkers. You know, I think people, <laughs> they underestimate how crazy it's going to get and then they're not humble enough and they're not prepared enough. You know, Matt Odell, he's famous for, you know, a lot of things, but one of them is stay humble, stack ass. And I, I joke with him that the stay humble part is actually the most important part of the, the statement, not the yeah, stack yeah, ass part, because yeah. I, I, I think we're so early. This is going to be such a revolution. 
and things are like if everything changes like everything like like there's no understatement for that like literally everything changes then our lives are going to be very very different and it's going to be hard to be prepared right and even mm-hmm. if you have a lot of bitcoin how's it stored how many people know about it like all these kind of like you know ideas for how to like get the pre hyper bitcoinization coins into the hyper bitcoin hyper bitcoinized world you know i, I think that these are it takes humility to get it right. And a lot of Bitcoiners are not going to make it. I think the vast majority of people here are not going to make it, sadly. And, you know, when I think of like the world where someone posts like, oh, I had 100 Bitcoin and I sold it for pedanas or whatever, or I mm. bought pizza with it. Like, I still think we're in that paradigm. Like, oh, 100%. We're actually closer yeah, to yeah. that world than we are to hyper Bitcoinization. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think the Bitcoiners living in it are like actually acknowledging that fact that they're actually closer to quote unquote Laszlo who spent, you know, how many Bitcoin on Papa John's? <laughs> they're way closer to that guy than they are to like the future hyper Bitcoinized world. Yeah, I, I, I think Bitcoin, adopting Bitcoin, now studying Bitcoin and then adopting Bitcoin is a game you play against yourself, I would say. Because the thing is just there, right? Like the thing just exists and... Yeah, it it will never die. It will continue forever. And just how many people are yeah, triggered by that, I want to say, and kind of like, you know, motivated to study, then yeah, also stack sets, right? Stay solvent, stack sets, get into this, hold on to it, right? Like it's all a game against yourself because the thing doesn't really care. So eventually it's just one big game against yourself. And and Having sto- having stomached like I think four eighty plus percent drawdowns, I still feel it when it goes down. I, like I'm not cured, <laughs> you know. So yeah, it's it's and and the other way around I think would be as well. Right? Like if we, I I always had in my mind like hundred k would break the internet. I obviously don't think that would that would break the internet now because every like a lot of people are skeptical. You know, so many people got burned by FTX, so they don't really care. But for me, 100k is, is like my mental, like my mental, uh, like KPI type thing. Like if it gets to 100k, then I know it'll be a million, 10 million, etc. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the way I see it, you know, and I know we're almost out of time, but I I talked about Pete, on Peter McCormick's podcast. You know, I, I kind of misspoke. I said three mental models for Bitcoin. I don't think I think it's it's really three logical scenario. Uh, you know, end results for Bitcoin. Result number one is Bitcoin's a paradigm shift infinity divided by 21 million and actually something that you alluded to a lot on the show which is like how much better would the world be with perfect money and with the egalitarian distribution of wealth and prosperity that bitcoin promises like how much you know how much would infinity be right i actually think infinity makes bitcoin big or bitcoin makes infinity bigger mm-hmm. so it's not just today's like infinity it's, it's the it's the future infinity divided by 21 million so that's scenario number one. I personally think that's the most likely scenario, but that's not the only scenario. Scenario number two is Bitcoin fails, whether it fails because the game theory is broken, which is the most likely reason for it to fail, or it fails because there's a superior technology that we could never foresee that emerges. That is another way that Bitcoin could fail. And people are like, well, what superior technology? Well, like, obviously, I'm not smart enough to to conceive of that like it's it, we can't see it it's, it's not has well, not it could emerged be 80 yet. years in the future right yeah like, who knows yeah. who knows so I, I think we have to leave room for the, either the incentive system is broken or there mm-hmm. is future technology that emerges that could displace bitcoin although I, I would say incentive system breaking first and then superior technology second would most would probably more likely than just superior technology because we've seen protocols have staying power so that's a nuanced point And then the last scenario, which I think is the least likely scenario, is the existing paradigm, which is Bitcoin's an asset, it has its properties, it exists, and there's all these other assets that are not denominated in Bitcoin, (laughs) right? There's Bitcoin is an asset amongst assets. Mm -hmm. I think that all three of those scenarios are possibly the scenario in the future. The last scenario, which is the existing scenario, the current paradigm is the least likely in the future. And therefore, you know, no one is bullish enough because most people are still stuck in the current paradigm world, which is like hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin. Then it'll go to this, you know, then it'll go to that. Like that's the current paradigm, which is like Bitcoin's an asset. It's going to suck up other store value from other things. It's competing with gold. 
Like, no, it, I would say like that is the current situation. That's the status quo. But for like hyper Bitcoinization is like Bitcoin supersedes all that stuff. Bitcoin becomes yeah. the denominator. Yes. Bitcoin, you know, is, is like this is game changer. And that's the ultimate bull case. Like, and, and I would say it makes more sense to prepare for a sen- hyper Bitcoinization scenario. And then it makes sense, you know, rationally. Then it would say ha- failure scenario is the next most likely scenario. And like the least important scenario to really like think about and worry about is the current existing status quo scenario, which is Bitcoin's a highly competitive asset, you know, amongst other assets, or it's not even competitive. Maybe the block board goes to zero, Bitcoin fails. Eventually, you know, eventually maybe it mm-hmm. goes to scenario number two. Who knows? But like kind of like weighing all these potential future states of Bitcoin, these logical scenarios for Bitcoin, I think is like really important. And I really do think like if w- scenario number one happens, like one, no one today is bullish enough because it's impossible to foresee a paradigm shift. But two, all of us have enough Bitcoin. Like if you own mm. Bitcoin in the, the pre hyperization world, you know, when Bitcoin is not the denominator, then like this idea, like you don't have enough Bitcoin is like silly. It's like, okay, so how much is enough money for you? A trillion dollars or a million trillion dollars? from like how much is actually enough for you like well you know I like, <laughs> like yeah. that's what people are going to be thinking about is like this early adopter version of bitcoin like how mm. much like how much is not enough sats for you is it a trillion or is it a million trillion <laughs> you know I, we have enough sats like just yeah. getting it across the finish line is way more important you know in terms of like your 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 lifestyle how it's expressed in the future yeah well i love the idea of that infinity could be bigger than what we think infinity is now and i think what you're trying to say there is that at least that's my understanding that Bitcoin will also incentivize people eventually to be more productive. So we will create more things, more things also of value. And if Bitcoin is then the denominator of all that value, then it's almost like it's, it's, it's like a perpetual motion towards just a way better world in a sense. And yeah, I love that thought. I hope, I hope we get to see that in our lifetimes. That, that would be awesome. If you have time for two more questions i'd love to ask you two more questions let's hit it okay what do you think is the biggest could be the biggest catalyst for global bitcoin adoption just the existing system failing people like the status quo persisting like Mm. again one billion doing our seven billion doing shit like it's not (laughs) the status quo is not great so yeah i just think bitcoin's better that's a very good point like it just keeps chugging along you mean like this flawed system yeah that's a very good point i love that yeah. There's no incentive to change that, right? For the incentive is people getting burned, right? Yeah. It's like Odell talks about touching the stove. It's like, all right, well, humanity is like perpetually touching the stove infinitely. And finally, there's something mm. new that offers something different. And some people will <laughs> decide yeah. to take their hand off the stove, you know? Yeah. 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 And yeah. over time, more people are like, oh, wow, you, you can take your hand off the stove, you know, and th- unfortunately it takes kind of, it's like gradually then suddenly, but I, I really think that that's the case. Yeah. That's also a lot of people have this, uh, the allegory of the cave, you know, that Plato's allegory of the cave. Yeah. It's like when you're in the cave, you don't, you can't understand of like what's outside That there's the cave. even a cave. Yeah. No. And yeah. the things you it's see just... are made up by other people. And then once you go outside of the cave, then you realize that there's this entire world that you never heard of. And and then even when you go back into the cave and you tell the people that, hey, there's more than this cave, you know, they, they will still not believe you. But yeah, I do agree. Like over time, more people will will figure it out. I think we should keep it that, that positive attitude. Definitely. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Oh, man. Good question. Yeah. So I have a tattoo. Uh, effectively, it says the key of life is to know nothing. So that's like the only thing that I've tattooed on myself. So that's probably one of my uh, most permanent core beliefs. And, you know, there's kind of two ways to think about it. It's either ignorance is bliss or it is stay open-minded. And it's kind of an interesting litmus test, the way that people interact, you know, uh, react to the tattoo. But in my mind, it's it's mostly, you know, stay open-minded. And really the way I see the, the world, the universe is, you know, we live on this planet. It's a tiny, tiny less than a a dust speck in the universe and everything we know is, you know, our observations from that vantage point. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you take it all into account, we know nothing. So, you know, the key of life is just to remember that. That's a great ender, man. Thanks so much for this conversation. Really enjoyed it and stay in touch. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode.